Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is the Wix Online Meeting 229, working our way into the middle of February. We were just talking about, I can't believe it's this already now, and it feels like the year just started, and Bob's like, well, it comes around this time every year, and I think he says it better than I do, because that's clearly not my line. Um, as always, these meetings are recorded for those of you that aren't with us right here, right now, so you're welcome. We hope you enjoy it. For you that are here, it's great to have you. Uh, let's go talk about what we're going to do, and if you're here, go ahead and say hi. Uh, Jacob is in the house. I feel like it's been a while since we've seen Jacob, but very good to see him here. Uh, what are we going to do? We're going to do triage, and then we're going to talk about this uh, thing that hit us starting, I guess, Tuesday night, uh, the GitHub Actions cancellation. I'll give you guys, everybody, a status update about what's going on there, and then we'll do usual questions and comments, things like that going on. All right, so, well, happy to have you here, and uh, I think the first thing we should go do is uh, get into uh, triage. You ready, Bob? All right, sounds like a plan. Let's see. Here we go. Um, Sean, you you reopened or retriaged this uh, first bug? Yeah. So where do you want to go? I wasn't sure whether we could just close it. Like, do you have any idea why we would need to run related bundles newest or oldest to newest or whatever they were asking for. Yeah, they want to remove the newest bundles first. Do you see why we should, there would be a problem if we did oldest to newest? Newest first would probably remove the most stuff earliest first. That would be the most normal newest. way of removing things. Right? I mean... You know, it's it's curious. I don't think that MSI documents, you know, a particular order. No, that's true. They do not specify the order that major upgrades would execute in. Well, it, it would, yeah, it'd be per row, but within the row, if there are multiple matches, I don't think, uh, well, sorry, I know that they don't dictate an order. Um, I'd be curious what their order is. Um, I don't think it matters, but new, if I were to pick an order, I would probably pick newest to oldest because you, you're more likely to end up with the bulk of the work happening in the first uninstall and the rest of them being, you know, basically just clean up no ops. But I think oldest to newest is also fine. I have no, no qualms that it's going to lead to bad behavior. The feature request is logical. Uh, how important is it? Uh, yeah. I don't know. I, I, that one, I'm, it makes sense. The thing is, is that there might be multiple, like, upgrades so like you might be removing one bundle that's completely unrated, unrelated to another bundle, but you're going to compare their versions even though that yeah, they're might completely not mean anything. Yeah, totally. If they're completely unrelated, it would matter less. I do. I like the idea that there is a prescribed order. You know, if if Mike's right that this was you know by GUID order, that's pretty. Well, maybe it's pretty cool. I don't know. Um, but having, you know, having there be an order by version, whether it's oldest to newest or newest to oldest, is meh. Yeah, I don't really care. <laughs> I mean, today it's going to do oldest to newest. Oldest I think that's fine. to newest. Hmm. Okay. I mean that one's interesting too. I, I, it's inter I could I could see that argument as well. Oldest to newest would remove all the ones that ha will have the least impact, and then the newest one does the most work at the very end, presumably, with the least amount of interference from all the older ones still in the machine. Yeah, I I think that's fine. I think Bob's probably right that the the strongest point here is it'd be nice if there was a a stable order just to remove that 
off chance that, you know, it only fails on this one guy's machine because that's the one machine that, the alpha, I don't know, things happen. Well, that was part of the other issue that I fixed was that it, there's a stable order now. Yeah. It's not yeah. just alphabetically by grid anymore. Right. That, that's the, for me, that's the high order bit. Exactly. So oldest to newest, I think, I think, I think saying remove by version with the newest bundles removed first. I think it'd be fine to say this has been resolved. They are removed by version, just the oldest bundles first, and then go from there. Yep. I don't think we're going to get pushback. Definitely not from Mike. So, <laughs> um, honestly, this is probably some Visual Studio thing. Yeah. All right. 11 years ago. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Easy one. Yeah. All right. So that'll go away. Um, I did not get a chance to look at this because I've been looking at what we'll talk about next instead. Um, but I, I will. <laughs> we'll get to this. All right. Wix deployed config files merging. Oh, this is a guy who wants the magical merge stuff. <laughs> Figure out what to do with my config files and just merge them for me. Thing. Um, yeah, so I, I actually did not close this um, primarily because, believe it or not, I could not find a feature request for JSON config. Okay. So I left it open for the possibility that we wanted to take this issue as a request for, uh, yeah, uh, JSON config functionality. I, yeah. Uh, uh, we I mean, have to essentially rewrite like, this issue. To me, it looks like they were asking for like UI that would help the user yeah. resolve conflicts. I know. <laughs> oh, not doing that. Yeah, that's what the issue says up front, and then it turned yeah, into, uh, can we do something with JSON config files? And then it's like, well, no. I, I don't think we should change. I think we should close this issue, kick it out, and be like, if someone wants to open an issue on for JSON, that would be fantastic if, if they want to do it. But we know it's out there. I don't think we need something floating around for that. Um, but this issue as written is not yep. concrete okay. enough to do anything with. Works for me. Um, six, seven, two, one ability to force uninstall bundle. Yeah. Sean. Yeah. So if you remember, I changed the logic to where it's going to look, whether the package is actually installed at the end of the chain to decide when to unregister. So if we have any bugs in there, it's, you're going to get to the point where you can't actually uninstall the bundle. So we probably should have some fail safe option. So the user can clean up even if we have a bug. Are there any ways they could use this for evil? Maybe. I mean, it might leave some things on the machine. Right. I if, guess. If they don't have it. I mean, if we add this, then people might use it. And then things would get left on the machine when we didn't want it. Right. When we wanted the bundle to still be there. Right. So is this... So are, thinking... you, are you talking about forcing an uninstall or forcing bundle cleanup? Like, remember today we have, sorry, in B3, we have the, you know, force uninstall, right? Which basically says ignore the conditions, but it's still a normal uninstall. I'm not sure if you're talking about something like, more like that or more like override the, the you know, logic that keeps or removes the bundle um, registration. Sorry, it's registration. Is it is it uninstalling, force uninstalling the chain or force uninstalling? Force unregistration. I was thinking it would be force uninstall at the bundle level, because okay. in V3 it's only at the package level. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. It's an interesting way to look at it. And it would unregist. 
it would remove the bundle from the add remove programs key and then the XE from the cache. Yeah. Anything else? Dependencies? Well, yeah, it would do the dependencies as part of uninstalling the bundle. Like it, would, that's... Sorry, it would uninstall the chain. It would run the chain. Yeah. Okay. I think it should. Uh, yes. And then the thing is that if it fails to uninstall, it would still remove itself in the end. Right. No matter what happened inside the chain, it's still going to uh, okay. remove itself. Yeah, that's interesting. Either way, you're going to end up with people, you know, wanting to run a registry cleaner. Um, it's probably better that, you know, there's a switch that would let them do a best effort cleanup. Uninstall everything. Would it remove the cache files? It would try to do the right thing during the chain. So it would do whatever the BA requested. But then at the end, no matter what, it would unregister. Ignore, basically ignore any, would it ignore package? It wouldn't ignore, uh, would it ignore package failure? So if a package failed to uninstall, it would still un remove itself? Yeah. So then you just end up with these packages left over. Would it still uncache them if a package failed to uninstall? It would. Probably not. Mm, okay. Unless I made it go out of its way. Yeah, I'm just. I. I don't. I don't have. I. I don't know what the right answer is in those cases. Um, I'm just trying to think through all of the. Where are we going to end up with when people use this thing? Because they're going to use it like, oh, look, this cleans it up, yay! And then with, then find out that stuff was not. Trying to figure out how much is not actually cleaned up if you use this. Um, so the cache would be one in the case of a package failure. I mean, I guess we could force clean all the packages, the cache for each package. Of course, yeah, you know, uh, a not insignificant number of removal failures are like, you know, prompts for source. But it is, so from my perspective, I find this interesting just because I know there's a, you know, there's an almost knee jerk immediate reaction to this kind of failure as a, all right, time to, you know, pull out the registry cleaner and, or you know, worse yet, manual registry cleaning and deleting files from the package cache and all that. So it's interesting to make a best effort to clean up everything option available. I think if you know the alternative, because the alternative is worse. I think people hacking things and trying to get them off the machine. Yeah. This, this is the kind of thing that's been, like, in my mind, a, uh, um, like a burn utilities pack, right? It's, um, you know, something that can go and clean up uh, dependent, you know, look, look, for, look for orphans, basically. Um, and in the time out of treatment of orphans everywhere, delete them. I, I'm not. <laughs> Sorry, it just occurred to me. Uh, we're finding orphans. I think just Annie would take them. offense to that. Uh, yeah, well. Where's the better tomorrow? Um, sorry. Um, not all of us with shaved heads are, you know, rich daddy warbucks types. <laughs> uh, 
guess which of us doesn't have a chair. Uh, let's see. Um, Sorry. So, so I, I envision this ex, as an external tool, right? Because there's a bunch of stuff that can that can go wrong, especially after a registry cleaner tries to clean without you know actually understanding everything that Burn does. Um, so, making it native is interesting. I think the functionality should live somewhere at some point. This, to be honest, this isn't a yeah. You know, I wouldn't consider this high priority at all, but it is one of those things that we could slip in that, you know, makes things slightly better um, in the case of, you know, stuff that just doesn't uninstall, you know, correctly. Because it's annoyingly easy to get into that state. Um, hopefully you never ship that, but that has happened as well. Now, for me, the, the the primary reason that I consider this as kind of an external tool is it's more likely that the uninstall is going to fail during an upgrade. Um, and I don't I, I I don't see anything here that's like okay, pass this switch to the bundle being upgraded uh, during related bundle actions. So th this is more of an, you know, th this is more of an end state, bring out the hammer before, um, before bringing out the, you know, sharpened sledgehammer of a registry cleaner. Yeah, that's trying to give an alternative to people running registry cleaners. What's the most likely case that you'll need this, that you'll end up using this? Uh, some kind of dependency bug where it thinks it needs to stay on the machine, but it shouldn't. That burn thinks this engine should stay on the machine because a dependency is out of whack or a yeah. bug calculated dependency is out of whack. Or someone messed up a detect condition on an EXE package or something. Right. So where MSI has a force recache reinstall where you can at least stomp over the MSI that's already installed to get new logic there to then uninstall it or whatever, right? Here, you don't get that option with a bundle. So the idea would be that this thing would let you out to get that thing off the machine after all. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting because it's, it's like the force recache reinstall for MSI, except it's more probably more intuitive to what most people expect. It's like, no, 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 I want that off the machine, not the let me force something forward so that then I could go backwards. This is really, yeah, just let that thing come off and I'll deal with the, the MSI package repercussions because I'm going to install it again. And hopefully you use it in testing, not in production. Ideally. What do we name One it? Can help. What do we name it though? See, it really has to say do not use this normally. <laughs> like I don't, you don't want someone to send it to a customer and have it feel natural. I want the customer to go, wait, what? Why am I running this command? This bundle messed up, you know, there you yeah. You know, burn.exe dash this bundle messed up, so we have to force uninstall it. <laughs> this bundle is messed up, so force it. <laughs> force uninstall. That might be a bit of editorializing. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Because so we don't want to just call it force uninstall because then people will be like, oh, yeah, that's the uninstall but the one that works. You're like, no, that's not the purpose of it at all. Um, well, 
we don't have to document this. This doesn't have to show up, you know, in the in the Wix standard BA help pop up. But it will somewhere. Well, that's going to happen no matter what. That's why I was trying to give it a name that nobody ever wanted to use by default. <laughs> like force unregister and cache or force unregister and uncache? The problem is that force doesn't scare anybody anymore. They're like, oh, that's the one that really works. That seems to be the attitude towards the word force now. Unsafe cleanup. Ooh. Unsafe may be the right keyword. Because it's actually correct. It's not safe, right? We're not... <laughs> we're cleaning up whether you like it or not. We're ignoring the dependencies, right? So... As the bundle dependencies. Yeah. But like... That's a little, a little weaker. If it's but... not supposed to uninstall a package, then it's not going to try... Yeah, yeah. Um, unsafe is pretty good. Yeah, I, I'd be, yeah, unsafe uninstall. Mm -hmm. Jacob's idea of purge isn't bad either. It'd be unsafe purge, but the problem is I think purge probably oversells what it's going to do. <laughs> Desperate. True. <laughs> Desperate housewives of setup land. I don't know. Um, um, <laughs> Pretty please uninstall? No, that's that's too nice. Unsafe is yeah, unsafe is the right word. If, if you're worried about people documenting it, pretty please uninstall. <laughs> that's, that's pretty. Uh, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> uh, hurt real bad. <laughs> Start yeah, breaking into the old Doom levels. Um, yeah, I think unsafe is probably the way to go. If you if it was called unsafe uninstall, although going back, I'm also. Bob's idea to use a separate tool is interesting as well. Well, I, I think there's, there's, uh, I like writing tools. Um, I think there's plenty of room for, you know, uh, burn explorer kind of thing. Oh, I, absolutely. Um, I, I agree. I, I just wonder if this should be relegated to some side thing or if it should be in the burn engine. And I, I don't have a strong opinion, but it's a interesting thing. But if unsafe uninstall is in, is probably the most unsafe force remove. <laughs> Let's just get all the words. Un, force unsafe. It could be force unsafe uninstall. <laughs> then you have to sit there and, and go through all the double negatives in your head to see if it's actually what you want. Force desperate unsafe purge uninstall. <laughs> <laughs> I think unsafe uninstall is probably a decent one because it, it does say... This is unsafe. You're like, wait, you're asking me to uninstall this unsafe? What are you doing to my machine? And that's really what you want people to think when you're doing it. Say, well, it's unsafe. We, <laughs> we're removing it anyway. Best of luck. Uninstall last resort, yes. All right. So I think that would be the way to go. Are you thinking this in V4 right now, Sean, to head off any problems going forward? Yeah, probably a good idea. I'm not against that. All right. Uh, seems reasonable to me. Unsafe uninstall. Yeah. Change that. Are you volunteering, Sean? Sure. Yay. Unless someone else is going to do it. <laughs> it sounds like fun. Uh, I'll get to it after I get my other one. <laughs> I'm just trying to get it below 50 I, so I can have less than three pages of bugs assigned to me. I think Rob was kidding. Um, I added this bundle of comment. I had this bundle of downgrade are supposed to. Yeah, this is just making oh. sure Bob doesn't forget about this issues that I brought up. Ah, got it. Huh? Very what? good. He already forgot. I See? heard my name. <laughs> <laughs> he already forgot. All right. Uh, yeah, so does this go to Bob then? Is that what that says? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Notice how quickly I made sure it didn't come to me? 
see, this is a problem because I'm the scribe. I'm like trying to fill out the previous bug, and you're on off to the next one, assigning me work. What the hell? Six seven two two. Uh, All right. Well, Sean gets the next bug then. Um, maybe I don't know if the next bug sticks around. I don't know what the next one is. All right, uh, here. Oh, all right. Bob took it. Then I feel that we're in a safe place. Okay, great. Uh, six seven two three VS extension needs to support VS twenty twenty two. Oh, done with change. And then there's a closed duplicate of this uh, because. That that was another bug requesting the same in WIC three fourteen, right? So I did not close this one. Ah, uh, this is in three fourteen. This is not in three fourteen. Sorry, this bug would be against three fourteen. Correct. We're, yeah. We're in, If someone wants there are to two go... aspects to VS 2022 support that are interesting. One is the, the actual custom action, um, which is yeah very straightforward to support a new version, though more code duplication than I'd prefer. Um, the second, that, that would be easy to port to 3.14. Uh, the second aspect is uh, custom action fitness. Um, you know, VS2022 is x64. It would not be unreasonable to request x64 custom actions. I'm not planning on doing that. I would not do that in 3.14. It would continue to be an x86 custom action like it is today. Uh, uh, I... Custom action select, bitness selection in, that I did in, in V4 requires a new uh, custom element. Yeah, no. we can no longer rely on property yeah, no. rats to, to pull in the right custom action. Yeah, yeah, so no, uh, we no, not but, do that in 314. No, <laughs> no. I don't care. If someone sent a PR for this at 314, we'd probably take it. I'm glad it's already done in 4. Need to go finish 4. So that's basically what this is all about. Ah, sorry, didn't mean to go there. Uh, so yeah. But would you do a build for it? Eventually. Eventually we're going to do a 314 build, so yes. I mean, there there will be more 314 builds as the ramp up for uh, helping port to Wix 4 comes along. So would I rush a build to for this? If someone asked really nicely, I'd go do it. But I really don't want to spend any time there. So, I mean, it was, it was Christopher Painter that was asking for it. And oh. he's the one that did the 2019 stuff last time. If he asked nicely, it would take the PR. Well, that's and, the linked bug. Okay. Well, then, 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 yeah. If, if someone sends a PR, we'll, we'll do the the min, the not the middle, the the copy part, right? That's fine. We take it. We do a build for him. Chris's been around for a long time, so he, we do it for him. Yeah. Um, well, then, how about we close this one and I will reopen the other one. <laughs> I don't care. Well, how's this one different? Sure. Um, V three and V four. 2019, but that's not true, right? V4 goes to 2020, two, 2022, right? Yes. Okay, good. So for the last six weeks or so. Six weeks, all right, so not that long. Okay, that's fine. Do all the things for 2019, for 2022 and 314, fine. Yeah, fine. I don't, I don't care, whichever bug, I don't, sure. <laughs> We aren't fighting for who has the highest bug open count here. Thank goodness. That was a thing at Microsoft, which always annoyed me. Testers out there trying to prove their value by opening more bugs, which was a very bad incentive for getting lots of duplicates and creating lots of work on the people that turned around and had them fix those bugs. I'm sorry. Just busy. Sorry. That's my sensitivity. I don't care which bug we pick. It doesn't matter. Um, either one is fine. And if someone sends the PR, 314, to do the detection that's basically copy paste of 2019, fine, we'll take it. And if Chris really, really wants it, we'll get him a build for it in a faster. All right, 6724. Uh, yeah, this is a good point. Set variables added can set a value to, set a variable to a static value. The analogous set property would, 
should be the analogous set property and MSI evaluates the string. Yes, okay, that's what I was looking for. Evaluates is the keyword here, right? So you can set it to, you know, the value X, but you could not have the value of X, right? Uh, change the type attribute so that the source has a type and the target variable has a type. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. That last part, keep the existing type attribute so the source has a type and the value and the target has a type. So you're suggesting add a target type, essentially, Sean? Yeah, I guess so. And we can't do it all with just one type? I mean, you're, you're basically saying take this, what does the target type allow us to do? Allows you us want to... to be able to specify the source as a formatted string, but the destination is a literal string. Oh, you want to make this, the destination a literal string. Right. Yes. Right. That That's the real change. I was trying to turn a string into a number. And I'm like, is there really value in doing that? But the formatted to literal string is a bit more interesting. Basically formatted to whatever. But what, if, if something is formatted... Well, that's interesting. Now you can't do that in MSI. You can't take the you can't use set property and assign it to another property. It, it's a string literal after the set property aside the one as a staller. So if set variables type was allowed to be formatted, then it would evaluate the source. Whatever the result of that would then be assigned to the. Uh, as a literal to the uh, target. And that, that makes sense because when we resolve a variable, we resolve it all the way down, don't we? Oh, I've forgotten now. Yeah. So you, you couldn't, you could have, making the target of the set variable formatted is never going to have any formatting in it. Right, but you might want to format it into a version, for example. Yeah, see, that's that's the changing the type that's interesting. You want to force the coercion. We don't co coerce today? Or this is just with the set variable element? Right. This is just the set variable. But like registry searches always give you strings. So if you want to do certain kind of comparisons, like a number comparison, there's no way to do that. Oh, that's right. Type is like raw. That always returns a string. You can't say type version? No. What are the other ones? Oh, like paths, right? No, numbers, strings. Yeah. Formatted strings. No, no, no. Sorry. Regi the, like registry search. Registry search has a type attribute. It, it, it only allows raw and number. Yeah. Number coerces, though, correct? No, it puts the, it keeps the hash or whatever, or it adds the hash or whatever. Interesting. That's just compatible with MSI there. Hmm. That's... Yeah, it's essentially... You want to... It's the... Yeah, see, it's the set variable. You want to declare the type of the target. Wait. What Does the type define the... The type right now defines the target type, right? Inset variable? Well, uh, but basically, yeah. I mean, it's it's kind of both. It's saying this is the type of the string that I have in the XML. And then that type is going to be used when it sets the variable. So you can't change the type of a variable is basically what it comes down to. Essentially, you want to cast 
here. Yeah. And we don't have a cast operator in burn today. Yeah, we want to take the value of a different variable and then be able to cast it into a different type in a different variable. So can we do that with one attribute? Because the source is whatever it is, and then the type could specify the target, and then it's being coerced. So the tricky one then is the formatted string, right? Because all those other scenarios would work. You could then take a source of a version and say the type on the set variable is string, and it would convert the version into a string, and you'd be off the races, and vice versa. It could be a string version, and you could say a, a string that happens to be a version and assign it to a type set version to a variable, and now you'd have a version of type variable. So that type value can be used to do a cast now. We just have, and if you say type, it's string right now. Is that that's string literal, right? I for, I haven't looked at that in. So yeah, long. I'm pretty sure we kept string as literal and yeah. formatted is yes. the. That's the, I, that's what I hoped we did. I just didn't want to assume, because it's but it's been so long. I haven't I haven't had to use that. Haven't got to use that feature in Burn. I look forward to being able to use that feature in Burn. I just haven't had to yet. Um. So. So in that case, if you said the output type was. If the type was literal, a string, and the source is formatted, then it should format it. And if the type was formatted, it should just copy it. Huh. That would be a way to, I mean, I think all that makes sense with the current type attribute. Essentially just saying, we know what the source type is, what do you want this type of the variable, and we will do coercion like we would any other time to jump over. And if the type is string and the source is formatted, then we will format it into the string literal. Does that make sense? But when you're authoring it and you want a string, it can't tell whether the source is a literal or a formatted. Uh, you have a hard coded value. Right, so we won't know the type of that. Well, no, if you say string literal, then we will attempt to format the child, the... So you're saying the source of the set variable should always be treated as formatted? I think so. I was working my way to that point. I think so. I'm, I'm trying to figure out if that has any problems. But I think that's it. Does that make sense? The only thing to think about is today we're trying to be smart and we, we inspect the hard-coded value to try to figure out whether it should be... Like if you don't specify the type. Yep. We try to figure out what it should be. Yeah, and I and we would continue to do that. And and ah, uh, so if we inspect it and you don't say then we're going to say it's a mm, sorry. So if we look at it like oh that's a number, so then we're going to say the type is number if you didn't say. And if we look at it, it's like oh that's a version, so that and if it's a string or if it's anything else, it's a string at that point. And then, so we would say the type, the output type is string. Yes, but we just keep assuming the source type is formatted. Yeah, I think that's fine. I think it also behaves the way people expect it to then. I'm gonna get a string literal out of this, unless you say it's formatted, right? If you say the type is formatted, then that string just gets copied over. It's like, yeah, okay, we won't, do any evaluation because you asked to take this formatted string and put it into another formatted string. There you go. It has not been turned into a, it has not been evaluated. Boom. 
which could be really cool. You could do some interesting things with that, I think. Yeah, you could end up creating formatted, you could end up at runtime building up formatted strings. Yeah, that's that's interesting. So I, I think it all works if the source type is considered formatted string. Yeah. And I think it works correctly for everybody else. Yeah. Cool. Cool, cool. All right. I think that's that one. Uh, is this a four Are we thing? doing this? <laughs> that was my question. Thank you. I'll let Bob go ahead. Yeah, I can do Are that. we doing this in four? Yeah. All right. It's kind of finishing. A, it's a finishing touch on the set variable because set variable is new in four, so... Right. And the formatted stuff is new as yeah, well. And the formatted stuff is new too. That's a very good point. Yep. yep. Oakley dokley. We're down to one again. Great. I'll be back next week. I promise. All right. So that was fun. Let's go talk about what's been keeping me busy instead of that one issue. Um, GitHub actions status. The um, All of our builds right now um, on GitHub Actions, so like every time you submit a PR and things like that, are being auto-canceled roughly four to five minutes into the build consistently, just out of the gate. It seemed to have started uh, Tuesday evening, and uh, and it seems to be only happening to us. I've asked around, and it doesn't seem like anybody else is hitting this. Uh, so on Wednesday, uh, I opened a ticket and GitHub is investigating that ticket. I've been assured they are looking at it and it is, they have gone through, it's funny, it's being explained to me as like, they're going through the seven days of grief and they're, they were currently in denial that there's no way this could be happening. Um, fortunately, it can repost consistently. So they very rapidly got to, uh, not acceptance. What's the one after denial? Um, anger, whatever. Um, everyone so far that has uh, dug into this at all has come to a, Similar conclusion, we think it has to do with the fact that we're updating Visual Studio on the build machine to add the ARM binaries. We need those because, well, we build for ARM and they are missing in the GitHub image. And the theory is that Tuesday being Patch Tuesday, yay, did you have your reboot this week? Uh, has done something that's now causing Visual Studio to force a restart even though we tell it not to restart uh, when applying the ARM stuff and so it just so happens that visual studio is doing its thing and then four minutes later the machine decides yeah now's a good time to restart things to uh whatever visual studio did that seems to be the the current working theory but the github guys are trying to get down to the root cause of this so i'm hoping we'll get an interesting story from them out of this at the same time i have gone and done honestly what i should have done before and submitted the change to the image to turn the ARM, uh, to add the ARM libraries that we need to the image that has been accepted this morning and is going to be rolled out whenever they've rolled out the next set of images, which happens one to two weeks kinds of things, which isn't good for our build right now. Well, wait, did you request the other tool set as well? Which other tool set? We need the V141 tool set. Yes, I asked for the 141. So I went to the... 2019 builds have the 141 ARM in it, and it was just missing from 2022. So it was very easy to put in. It's like, here, 141, you have it for x86, x64. If you want to build ARM, you need the ARM libraries. Here's the lines to add the ARM libraries, and they took it. And so hopefully 2022 will look very much more like 2019 when it comes to building ARM libraries within a week or, I don't know, it depends on what their ship cycle is or where we hit the ship cycle on the images. They're also rolling out 2022, the image that we're using as the latest image, the standard image, so we'll get caught up on that. So anyway, uh, this is still affecting us. Uh, Sean has been maintaining in the background the uh, App Bear library for us, which has turned out to be a great thing, so we're able to at least go and see if things pass on that side. Um, oh, on top of this, uh, when I've added and I've tried to fix up validation and get a several tests, those tests are now... Uh, they were consistently working before I committed and they made it through all the builds before the builds started blowing up. And then after that, they've been intermittent. Different issues are showing up. So on top of all this, that made life uh, interesting. That issue is still there and that's what I'm working on. 
with AppBear in place, we can at least take PRs, verify that they're built on AppBear, which has the ARM libraries on by default, and so can get through the whole build. And so we're gonna, you know, kind of live in this state a little bit until we see what happens based off of the GitHub uh, responses, both on how long it takes the image to get around and what they find is the root cause of this issue at the end. So um, it'll be an interesting learning experience with GitHub Actions at the end of this. All I can say is that everything is underway and I don't have anything, I don't have exact timing on when things are done or will be done, but it's going. And in the meantime, we'll limp along with the app bear uh, in the background with the GitHub failing. And uh, if it lasts too long, we will evaluate other options. So yeah, on top of that, we also noticed that we are having x64 binaries in the 32-bit folder for I, the I, SDK. I think that's a bug that only that I have just now exposed by actually testing more things using those, and so that's just something I went, I'm digging into. I looked back, yeah. and before your change, it was all x86. Yeah. So it, there was 32-bit binaries in the 64-bit folder before your okay. change. And now there's 64-bit binaries in both? Yeah. Yeah, I, I could see how that might have happened because I was having failures building inside uh, MS Build, 64 bit inside uh, Visual Studio when they were 32 bit because, of course, it didn't match. And I did not apparently make the fix correct to hit, get 32 and 32 and 64 and 64. Um, so we'll, I will go figure that out. Uh, but the I thing is, is that you broke me and App Bear when you switched it. <laughs> so I created an issue with MS Build where MS Build is loading the wrong task. So like the test is running 64-bit MS build, but it's loading our 32-bit task. Well, that's interesting. In proc. Wait, it's loading the 32-bit? Yeah. See, this is the part I don't understand because all these tests were in and passing. So there, there was a, there's an MS build issue here that should have caught this problem. Yeah, what I don't understand is why are we seeing it now when we didn't see it when I was building it? Like, I actually changed something to make it work in 64-bit. Why is it now failing when it worked here and then it worked on the build machine when I submitted that to this? I That doesn't... Unless there was a... Oh, was there an MS Build chain? Did we get an MS Build change of Visual Studio on Tuesday that did this? Is that well, possible? Something that's different is is that I don't use the developer command prompt initialization. I manually set the path to the 2022 MS build. Okay. And I had set up App Bear to do the same thing. So uh, that is different. So that's one wrinkle in that MS build issue is that the the whole, the issue with loading the wrong DLL is only exposed in my setup. Okay. And not your setup or the GitHub action setup. Yep. That'll be interesting to find the root of that then. So that explains, so you don't run the, uh, you don't import the developer import, um, developer command prompt to get all the libraries and everything hooked up. Okay. Well, then... So does that mean we, well, I'll go fix it, get the binaries right, and then we'll figure out what we do with MS build after that. I mean. So my guess is, is that you might have to keep those tests skipped until we figure out the MS build issue. All right, well, I guess I'll have to go figure that out then. Because my guess is that once you get the binaries correct, it's gonna start failing. A different way? You say it's failing for you now. Oh, you say it's going to start failing for me? Well, okay. Yeah. That'll be interesting. All right. Well, that's good to know that I may have non things non-related to having the wrong bitness binaries in these folders that I'll have to watch out for. All right. Um, yeah. So it, it this is, we had a cascade of issues hit all Tuesday night after everything was working Tuesday afternoon and I went to go get kids. I was like, great. Everything passed. It's all green. 
come back and everything's blowing up. And I'm just like, uh, okay, that's odd. Because <sighs> nothing was bypassed to get here. So um, patch update Tuesday for the win, right? Yeah. All right. That's the state of that. Fun stuff. Other things people want to talk about. Anything else going on in the world? Uh, things out there to discuss? Um, I don't have... I'm trying to get myself down to two pages worth of issues, which would be 50. So I'm getting closer, but still have more work to do. Do you think you can do the XE package bugs for me? Oh, those are blocking you? Okay, yeah, I'll look at those again then. I don't have huge priorities. I have two large things to do, uh, cab spanning and then all the patching stuff. And at some point I'm just gonna have to, well, I'm going to prioritize those and just start just trudging my way through those last, I hope the last two big things. Um, but I could do the XC package uh, fixes first before I do that. Yeah, I'm looking at the validation failures right now, of course, uh, but I'll look at the XC package uh, commands next. Or it's detect, right? The detect stuff, detect condition. Yeah, detect condition and yeah, I guess permanence. It's two bugs Where, around that. Yeah, it's, yeah, all around the same thing. Yep, yep. And then it would have been nice to have the patching stuff before I made all those dependency changes. So it'll be interesting to see how the tests do once we get all that patching stuff working again. <sighs> yeah. So. Yeah, one of the things I'm going to do, I have a commit already started, is that uh, I found a number of tests were still skipped and didn't have GitHub issues tracking them. And so as part of doing the validation work, I added validation for merge modules and found just a series of bugs in there, which means, well, a lot of our tests were disabled in that whole area. So it's like, ugh, okay, great. And added a bunch around merge modules, things like that. So that just was like more work than I expected for. Honestly, I thought for something that I already had was going to be easy and done. By the way, I'm filling space. If you guys have questions from the chat, I, that's mostly what we're leaving here. But this is, you know, we're catching up here. So um, I want to make sure you guys have enough time to type and have it go out to the internet and come back to me to make sure we have time to answer that. Um, anyway, so yes, the patching thing is, um, I'm, I'm not looking forward to it, but I've pretty much always dreaded getting into patch. I mean, it's, it's not my area of expertise and I don't enjoy it, but the people that do work on it aren't working on it anymore. So I have inherited all of that and get to make it work. So it'll be fun um, at some point. I'm looking forward to how patching will work in, in Wix v4. I think it'll be a big improvement over, over Wix 3. Well, yeah, it, yeah it'd be, it's way less complicated from a user point of view. And it's not yeah. more complicated internally, but right. that's unfortunately not saying nearly anything given how complicated patching is. Nope, 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 that's true. <laughs> the, the, it, just when I was first getting into it again, I had totally forgotten about the two transforms. And, and at this very moment, I cannot describe the, 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 the purpose of the two transforms because I never hold it in my head long enough because I don't deal with it enough. So I always have to relearn or just reload that dual transform context again, and it just creates the wackiest things inside the code that, to handle these the different transforms. It's just like, oh gosh. And that's just two if you have only one baseline. Then it just explodes from there as you have multiple baselines. It's just, oh, I do not enjoy yeah. patching in any way, shape, or form. But No, I've been in that code, and it's very unpleasant. Yes. But you remembered that there are two, so that's the first step. <laughs> yeah, it's really bad if you don't know there's two. I mean, you're like, what right. is going on here? This doesn't make any sense at all. Um, yeah. Anyway, that's that's patching. Uh, I was I was honestly would, I think I'm going to tackle cab spanning first before I tackle patching. Mostly because I was in the cab code again recently for oh because of the live stream and we we're diagnosing why uh, the the incremental build wasn't working and ended up having to go down the cabs and try to blame it on cab code. And in the end, I think we did blame it on the cab code. Uh, so once I got in there and then got back out and saw the cab spanning stuff around, I'm like, all right, this at least is relatively straightforward work. I just have to get set up and then work my way through dealing with all of the complications it creates in the system. But it's, it's you know, it's not a multi-week 
problem, I don't think, like patching could turn into. Um, so I think it's going to be mentally much easier to get cab spanning done as you know one of the big features, as one of the big rocks to get that done and breathe and be like, all right, cool, that was good. And then know to tackle patching as opposed to tackle patching, <laughs> survive that, and then come back and go, and I still have to do cab spanning. Uh, so... That I'm, that's why I think I'm taking catch first. But I will go do the XE package uh, detect condition permanent uh, bit of stuff before I jump into cat spanning. All right, I have filled a bunch of time there. Uh, chat has been nice and quiet, or unfortunately quiet. I, don't, I hope you guys are doing all right. Um, we will be back in two weeks. I think that's normal. Normal slot, yep, 24. I will be older. Although I guess that's kind of a tautology, but... Um, We'll see that. So uh, two weeks from now, same place, same time, doing the same thing. Hopefully we see all of you again. Maybe we'll see some more people. And we will do the same thing. We'll do triage and we'll talk about anything else that's going on. Hopefully everything is working smoothly and we just have a lower bug count when we get there. Sound good? I think that's it. All right. Until next time, you guys take it easy. See you later. Bye. Bye. Bye.